how does democratization change the equation? In the case of the Soviet Union, not a democracy, so we didn't have to worry about public opinion. Arguably, the United States, the leadership of the United States, was much less uh, subject to opinion through the period of the Cold War than it is now, or at least we have a demonstrated propensity to respond more to opinion. Does that make for less stability? I mean, we, are we moving structurally in a way that the personalities will have less of a capacity yeah. to say, we don't want annihilation and more of a propensity to pander? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't use the word pander necessarily, <laughs> listen to our publics. <laughs> um, I think part of the answer is that the situation has changed. What we're faced with now is, I think, um, the, the most important threats are not the threat from the Soviet Union or from Russia. Uh, and therefore, horrendous though uh, um, a terrorist bomb would be, um, are uh, horrendous though the use of uh, a small number of nuclear weapons would be. It's not the same as what we were thinking about in the Cold War. Um, the first strategic um, single integrated operational plan, the PSYOP 62, the first integrated plan for nuclear war, envisaged that if the US carried out uh, its uh, kind of preferred option in a war of a preventive strike, it would lead to the death of 283 million people in the Soviet Union, China, and Eastern Europe. I think that's not what we're, I think we dealt with that in some ways. I, I think not as completely as I would like because the US and Russia still have very large forces on, uh, uh, some of them on high state of alert. But I think the, um, therefore I think the US president or indeed the Russian leader, um, the danger, they would not feel so constrained if it were a matter of using one nuclear weapon or two nuclear weapons. There's an element in Russian doctrine that you would use nuclear weapons to de-escalate um, a, a local war. Uh, which was also thinking in, Na in NATO, uh, or at least there was discussion of that, how, how far it was planned, I don't know. Uh, and that could be very dangerous, that you would think, oh, this is not leading to an all-out nuclear war, it's leading, we're sending a signal, don't escalate. Well, what if the other side doesn't pay attention and you do get escalation, it could be dangerous. I think, um, actually, in the Cold War, what strikes me uh, is not so much I think the American president, uh, if an American president decided to use, had decided to use nuclear weapons, uh, at least initially the US public would have supported that because it wouldn't be done except in an ex extreme case. But there was very big concern about what popular opinion in other parts of the world would be, especially in Asia. Uh, in the 1950s, the CIA did a report on, you know, what would popular reaction be if we used nuclear weapons in one of the crises in East Asia. And, um, and that was seen as, you know, that would basically destroy U.S. influence. I mean, it's very interesting to look at those assessments. And I think any leader would have to think about what the political fallout uh, would be from any use of nuclear weapons. Um, and I think that's why most doctrines say it's only in the most extreme circumstances that you know, we, would, we would use them. And we don't get quite the same brinkmanship, I think, that, that we had, had, had in the 50s and 60s. To, although in the Indo-Pakistani relationship there have been crises and that's been, that's been quite dangerous. Sorry, I'm, I'm giving you a long answer uh, to the question. I don't, uh, I think the only thing that would make use of nuclear weapons more likely is the belief that you could use one or a small number and get it, and that would be it. And I think that wasn't the case in the Cold War where you thought, no, um, there's a real danger of escalation once you cross the nuclear threshold. That still remains to some degree, but I think it's weakened. Thanks, David. Uh, we were talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the public opinion, so I actually have a question that kind of connects the two. 
What's puzzling, one of the things that are puzzling today when we look back at the Cuban Missile Crisis is the fact that between October 15 and October 22nd, pretty much, basically, the American diplomacy was successful as keeping the crisis and the making a complete secret from the public and from the Allies. So I'm just curious about how was it decided that Kennedy had to speak on that day? Like, why not later or why not sooner? Do we know that? I think it was driven by what they saw about the Soviet preparations uh, of, of the missile uh, launchers. Uh, um, so you couldn't leave it go forever. He had to make an announcement to the Soviet Union or make an announcement to uh, the uh, American public um, that uh, they were going to take actions and announce what the actions were. They may, I don't recall this, I, maybe somebody here knows the answer, that there was some concern maybe if, if this leaked, it would be, uh, it would be very um, uh, harmful both for def implementing a strategy, but it could be politically very harmful also for Kennedy. So the important thing was to come out, seem very strong, make the demand. But it's interesting that Khrushchev, their speculation, uh, when I mentioned the meeting earlier before, they, before Kennedy's speech, was that Kennedy would announce an invasion of Cuba. And Khrushchev's immediate reaction then was to think, oh, he's weak, um, you know, it's only a quarantine. And you see him for a day or two trying to kind of, you know, continue to keep the missiles there. But then it becomes clear to him that that's not going to work.